hello everyone. My name is Jason Toe, and today I will be presenting on a topic specifically uh, called e-waste. And the title of my presentation is The World's Electronic Graveyard, Solving the E-Waste Dilemma. So as a roadmap for our presentation, first we're going to start off talking about what is actually e-waste, what is the worldwide distribution of e-waste, uh, tracing the chain and path of e-waste as it comes in, um, resource in Agba Bloshi, which is in Accra, Ghana, and alternatives to informal e-waste recycling. So to start off, before I show you this next video, does anyone have a question, uh, have a, know what e-waste is, like have a thought? You can just say it out. Yes? Yeah, so it is uh, waste from any type of technology products. So this video will give you a nice overview. How many phones have you owned? Every year, the world produces 1.4 billion new phones. Stacked up, they reach well past the International Space Station. Here's the thing, those billion new phones will be old phones in two years. So what will happen to them? Now look at your phone. Actually, look inside your phone. It's not just glass, plastic, and metal. It's a huge threat to people and the environment. It's e-waste, the vast global stream of old TVs, computers, tablets, and phones. It's the fastest growing source of waste on the planet, the biggest source of toxic metals in landfills, and the U.S. is the largest producer. In half of all U.S. states, you can just dump e-waste in a landfill. There are no federal laws to regulate what happens to it. Some of it gets shipped to other countries with fewer health and safety laws, posing a risk to the people who recycle it and the air and water around them. Now look at your phone. How long until it's just e-waste? So as you can see there, we all each have a lot of technology that are e-waste products, all on us, all around us. This picture right here uh, is a picture of a mound of computers um, that were being processed for their waste. Specifically, uh, e-waste is unusable electronic uh, equipment. So it's not, it's not every single electronic equipment, but it's products that cannot be uh, reused again, resold again. Um, these types of recycling methods to use to process them include dismantling them, which means just physically pulling them apart, as well as a common one is burning the uh, electronics for the metal under them. Um, this includes any electronic products from phones, computers, cell phones, household appliances, as well as cars and refrigerators. So if there's a technolo technological component in anything, it can be considered e-waste. So these maps right here kind of show the spread of e-waste around the world. So as you look, you can see in from North America to many of these other countries in the European Union that a lot of times they ship the electronic products, um, unusable electronic products around, over, around the world. So these include places like China, Thailand, um, and as well as in Africa and places like Nigeria and Ghana specifically where uh, the site I went to worked at. A lot of times these electronics are marketed as secondhand goods, which means that they are able to be reused again. But a sizable amount of these products, up to when I was learning in Ghana, up to about 20 to 25 percent when they're shipped off, are not able to be reused again and are just waste products. So the state in 2009, over 50 million tons of e-waste was discarded. Um, by 2020, this is supposed to be increasing by about 45%, 1990 levels, which still is a huge increase in a 30 year period. Um, and the key thing is many of these countries that are shipping away these uh, unusable electronic products could actually responsibly recycle them in their country. And it would only cost between about six to $12, uh, $12 uh, per ton to um, have them formally recycled. One of the key things is that there, are, like, we, like the video state, there's not really federal laws or even international laws regulating this. Now there have been some attempts to regulate, and specifically the Basel Convention um, was adopted at the 6th May of the Conference of the Parties um, um, in 2002. 
The goal was to prevent the illegal spread of, um, of importation of uh, unusable electronic products. The problem with the Basel Convention is it's not enforceable and it has it so it hasn't really stopped the growth of e-waste. It's just kept it going. So this next part of the talk, we're going to look at tracing the chain. So this is looking at from going from importation of e-waste into a country to final dismantling. So to start off, we're just going to give a general overview of Ghana, um, which you can see uh, here located in, in the continent of Africa. It has about a population of 28 million uh, with a GA, uh, gross national income about $1,380. Um, this was the site of Agua Bloshi, which is the easy way sites that I went to. Um, we'll touch more on that site later on in this presentation. So you can see here, this is the port of Tima, which is in Ghana, um, and it serves as the primary location for uh, importation of electronic products. So the port, uh, port of Tima receives 85% of all of Ghana's imports, um, like 10 million tons of total goods. And about 250,000 of those are um, used electronics, um, such as phones and computers. Now, a lot of those electronics are able to be reused. And one of the reasons why um, you know, a lot of electronic products aren't just banned to be imported overseas is that a lot of times these technologies can be refurbished and used and people can have new laptops and phones. But as stated previously, about a fifth of these are not able to be worked on. And this leads to them being scrapped in e-waste uh, yards. So what happens is, um, individual, so to start off, um, individuals go around collecting um, these unusable electronics and they put them on these small pool carts as you can see uh, on the, the picture right there. Um, these items such as like a broken laptop can be purchased at about $1.25, um, which in Ghana is about six CD, which is their currency. These electronics are often taken to a scrapyard um, to where they are further recycled. this is a video of dismantling so just watch as you can see them burn for the uh, the copper and the plume of smoke that's flying behind it so yeah so as you can see there that is uh, one of the most common practices of actually processing electronic waste so let's say you say you have your computer so you have your you have your iPad, your MacBook, whatever it may be. A lot of times when it gets to the scrapyard and it's ready to be processed, um, you'll break it apart, um, break, take away a lot of the main practice, um, plastics, and then you'll burn the rest to get to the precious metals, such as like the copper that um, reside in it. The problem with this is it creates a lot of air pollution, as you can see by the huge plume of smoke. Um, and this can lead to a variety of health and environmental issues. Specifically, um, you know, the exposures from this dismantling includes things such as lead, cadmium, and mercury. Um, and because, uh, because um, a lot of these sites, uh, specifically in Ghana, this site was built on a previous lagoon, there's a lot of staining water. Um, and it can be a, a host for vector-borne uh, diseases, which can lead to spread of malaria. Additionally, a lot of this times, this happens in high crowded areas, specifically in the location in Ghana, it's about 100,000 people living in the scrapyard facilities and around in the neighboring slum, and this can lead to um, a host of, uh, of uh, infectious disease transmission. If you look at the pictures there, you can see a settlement on the top left, um, which is in the neighboring slum. Um, it talks about, it's been marked by the, uh, the Metropolitan Association to be uh, destroyed um, because they like to destroy the, the slum settlements, but it had, that one hasn't been. Um, there's still many of them up. Um, to the right of that, you can see um, a goat eating some of the trash. And so there's a lot of goats and cows and chickens that are um, at these sites, specifically at this one in Ghana too. Um, you can see another goat. And then that's a marketplace where you can see right in front of the slum, which includes a lot of... Uh, uh, of produce. So those are all, whether it's from eating, breathing the air, drinking the water, eating the produce, eating the animals, um, those are all path, path, pathways to be um, exposed by some of these harmful products. 
So this leads to a multitude of health effects such as respiratory, um, infections, bronchitis, fibrosis, um, it can scar up lungs, um, it can lead to COPD, um, cancer, it can lead to a lot of uh, harm in the nervous, digestive systems, immune systems, as well as the potential for physical in injuries with a lot of the uh, hammering um, and, and breaking down of the products. And this picture here kind of just shows um, just a diagram of all the places it can infect. And as you can see here, it's basically the, each chemical that's used in it um, can infect anything from up from the neural area to down to the digestive area. Um, it can lead to a lot of harmful effects. So after a day of spending about 12 hours working and dismantling um, these electronics, you will get um, a bag of materials. So on the left there, you see that's a copper bag. And that copper bag is typically sold for about $2, 2 USD. So in Ghana City, it's about 10 CD. Um, for just comparison, 10 CD can get you um, like a, oh, a decent meal at a restaurant. So for working for about 12 days, uh, 12 hours in a day, you can get money to buy basically enough for a meal. So I'm gonna, in this part of the presentation, I'm gonna hear a little more about the research in Agua Bloshi, Ghana. Um, this research was conducted from June to December 2016 um, with the University of Michigan. So my primary uh, question was, what are methods to solve the unregulated electronic waste recycling practices that harm human health and the environment? So one of the key things is uh, we went around conducting a lot of uh, stakeholder interviews um, with people from a lot of the workers to uh, the nonprofits to the government to see what are ways that we actually can um, help solve this issue. So just give you a little background. Um, that's what Agua Pelosi used to look like back before um, it turned into the Eway Scrapyard. Um, in 2005, scrap dealers first moved into the area known as, um, that was known as the Corle Lagoon. Um, these dealers started to collect and sell materials um, such as metals. Um, as, as time went on, uh, their people continued to grow and now there's a uh, 100,000 people at peak um, in the Agba Blosley community today. This is kind of a map of the scrapyard and slum. So as you can see on the top left, that's a scrapyard and that shows you sites of um, where a lot of the uh, recycling takes place. And just right over the river, you can see a huge, uh, a huge um, slum settlement, which houses most of the 100,000 people. Um, and in between, you can see the, uh, the Aldu River, which flows between. I stated a lot of this, a lot of the materials from the uh, waste can run off into the river and is in the air. The key thing about this slum, as well as there's a, a host of women and children that are, that are living there, which adds to even more vulnerable populations to these exposures. So stated, we talked with a lot of stakeholders. So um, some of our stakeholders, the first one is doing Black Star Solar, which is a solar company that looks to um, increase uh, electric electricity access to people who currently don't have access to electricity. Um, um, and they stated that they would like to see safety measures um, to help keep these workers safe. Um, Healthy African Child Foundation is a nonprofit that works directly with the e-waste workers and they really want to see uh, new opportunities um, for the workers, um, workers so that works that new career paths that are, do not just uh, count on e-waste. Um, the University of Ghana, Ligon, a lot of the public health research is looking at identifying the exposures and identifying the health impacts that are coming from doing this e-waste work. Um, the Ghana Environmental Protection Agency has so far placed a levy on e-waste shipping. Um, so basically, they're taxing, <coughs> they're taxing uh, uh, shipments of uh, electronic uh, waste into the electronic waste into the country, um, and they're hoping to possibly see um, more solutions on how they can limit that and make it more formalized. And Jacoa Ventures, which is a waste recycling company, waste disposal is looking at. Um, that they're getting uh, authority to actually collect and recycle the e-waste. 
Um, and the last list of stakeholders includes Ministries of Trade and Industry, which is looking at just a full on band of electronic waste. They did this with refrigerators. Um, and they would like to see the area basically cleared up. The National Youth Authority would like to include activities, um, make it a rec center, um, and have the environment clean. Um, Scrap Deals Association, which is in, uh, in practice is supposed to be with the, for the workers' interests, um, doesn't really want to see any intervention without uh, talking with them, but uh, that, so that's for them. And the e-waste workers as a whole want to have, be safe and protected and look for opportunities for advancement. So taking all these into account, uh, I came up with some alternatives um, to former e-waste recycling. So I stated about this ban for the Ministry of Trade Industry, be positive for the environment, and pollution reduction. But it would not reduce the number of individuals, um, uh, small businesses, that it would reduce the number of individuals that have access to actual usable electronics, because you'd be banning all importation of, of electronics. Um, does not address current degradation, um, and does not look into um, workers' um, current uh, economic uh, ability. Uh, the Waste Disposal Service Shakur Ventures, um, if they were to come and just clean up Agba Bloshi, it would improve the environment, um, health, and uh, the land would be clean, but it's short term, doesn't look at the e-waste as a whole, the whole cycle, um, and does, again, not consider the livelihood of workers. Um, this levy from uh, the Ghana EPA, they would also look at making a a recycling facility, and as well, environmental improvement, health, slow importation, formalizes process, and pays individuals who would bring in e-waste. So, like every person could bring it in and have it formally processed. Um, does not the key things? It does not necessarily restore the lagoon, and it does not provide alternative for current e-waste workers, um, which could reduce uh, income from those workers. And lastly, you could have a international um, or national developer come in. Um, and similar kind of to the, EP, uh, the Ghana EPA, it could formalize the process and clean it up, but it would only provide about 10,000 jobs, which as I stated at high peaks, about 100,000 people there. So it's kind of hard. This next segment is an example of what a business can do to so, recycle. Years of innovation. A true innovation means considering what happens to a product at every stage of its life cycle. Meet Liam. When it's time, Liam deconstructs your iPhone. Bum, 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 bum. Parts are detected bum, 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 bum. and removed and separated. So the materials inside those parts bum, 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 bum. can be repurposed bum, bum, bum. to rescue cobalt and lithium from the battery. Separate the gold and copper in the camera. Extract silver and platinum from the main logic board so the materials in your iPhone can live on. Because in a world with limited resources, some things can't be replaced. An example of Apple is an example of how a business in itself can look to responsibly recycle its projects. So after analyzing all these things, my main takeaway is, is that any proposal on electronic waste should look at things from an, an ethical view, an economic view, financial, political, and environmental perspectives. Um, decisions need to highlight who would be helped and who would be hurt, um, as well as the cost of these solutions. Um, they need to look to how they can reduce other issues that are in and around Agba Bloshi due to the um, informal e-waste sectors. Um, and stakeholders from the government to the e-waste workers to nonprofits to any individuals need to be in involved in these solutions. To Lord Murray, you can view the full case study, which is on uh, this website right here. Um, and when this is shared, you'll be able to go straight to that, but I'll leave that for a second. Um, does anyone have any questions? That's back there. Um, so this thing is it's fantastic. But this is a lot from the perspective or the side of the, about the countries that are actually receiving the waste. But most of the waste are actually produced by Western European countries and the US. And do you think 
would there be some way to create incentives for countries or companies to actually reduce the amount of waste that's being produced and being shipped to other countries? Or, you know, like, would, is there any work that's been done in that? So, and my thought for that is kind of the view of, for example, like I shared the video, like what Apple does is, it's if a company slash country wants to look at, at itself as green or sustainable, then that kind of can help produce it. If there's, like I said, in terms of policies, if there's things such as economic benefits or subsidies that a company, uh, a company could get for reducing its waste, the waste it sends out, or producing um, projects in other countries that have been impacted, that's other um, areas that can drive them. So they kind of need, either need a economic slash policy uh, move um, to kind of kick them to kind of reduce the waste and reform, it, formally recycle it. Did you? Um, I noticed in the presentation and um, e-waste is not the only issue that's affecting um, the world. Uh, we seem to partition, I'm kind of piggybacking off of what the gentleman said uh, previous prior to me. Uh, it seems like we're dealing with this more as a regional or, or a national problem more than an international problem. And is there anything that uh, in your research or your thinking that would kind of lend a mindset to the rest of the world that we're connected, maybe even looking at where Ghana is geographically located and what incentive how could we incentivize the rest of the world to take a uh, position that they are affected in the long run by what's going on in the localized issues that we have? And it's not only e-waste, it's waste, it's, it's global warming, it's, it's a whole conglomerate of things that we're dealing with. So for that, uh, and I'll just repeat the question, basically, how can we get individuals that are not in these countries these, uh, that are experiencing a lot of the effects of e-waste um, to actually see that um, these issues like e-waste and climate change and a lot of these environmental problems affect them as well? Um, so my answer to that would be kind of show that, like you said, we all all interconnected. So. If I produce, if I um, am shipping a lot of waste to a country and it's hurting their, their individuals, their health there, the environment there, their pollution there, that in itself can hurt that company's economic potential, can hurt the country's health, um, can then lead to them producing less resources that could be used from other individuals as well. These, uh, these impacts, as we, like you said, as, we, as they spread, um, they're harming people, not just the people there, but everyone else, because as those people get harmed, we are harmed by these impacts. Um, we also now have to use more resources to try to correct these impacts that we could have just prevented. So now we're harmed, help, our country is harmed by economics, this country is harmed by health. Um, so the biggest thing would be kind of to trace the chain of how the products and decisions that we use here affect others and other countries. And we need to look at it from from each business to business and as a nation as a whole saying how can we work together to limit our waste and produce um, products and actions um, that are beneficial to everyone involved in this system.